the highland clearances was the forced displacement during the 18th and 19th centuries of a significant number of people from traditional land tenancies in the Scottish Highlands, where they had practiced small-scale agriculture. It resulted from enclosures of common lands and a change from farming to sheep raising, an agricultural revolution largely carried out by hereditary aristocratic landowners. A highland clearance has been defined as an enforced simultaneous eviction of all families living in a given area such as an entire glen. The clearances are particularly notorious as a result of the brutality of many evictions at short notice, and the abruptness of the change from the traditional clan system, in which reciprocal obligations between the population and their leaders were well recognized. The cumulative effect of the clearances devastated the cultural landscape of Scotland in a way that did not happen in other areas of Britain. The effect of the clearances was to destroy much of the Gaelic culture. The clearances resulted in significant emigration of Highlanders to the sea coast, the Scottish lowlands, and further afield to North America and Australasia. In the early 21st century, more descendants of Highlanders are found in these diaspora destinations than in Scotland. The clearances were a complex series of events occurring over a period of more than a hundred years. Economic and social background The enclosures in rural England in the British Agricultural Revolution started much earlier, during the Tudor period. Similar developments in Scotland have lately been called the lowland clearances by historians such as Tom Devine. But in the Highlands, the impact on a goidelic speaking semi feudal culture, which had included the fulfillment of obligations of a chief to his clan, led to vocal campaigning against the actions. There has been a lingering bitterness among the descendants of those forced to emigrate or to remain in crofting townships on very small areas of poor farming land. Changes in clan leadership From the late 16th century, laws required clan leaders to appear in Edinburgh regularly to provide bonds for the conduct of anyone in their territory. This created a tendency among chiefs to identify as landlords, rather than leaders of men. The lesser clan gentry increasingly took up droving, taking cattle along the old unpaved drove roads to sell in the lowlands. This brought wealth and land ownership within the clan, though the highlands continued to be overpopulated and poor. The landowners considered the crofters to be virtually free labor, and forced them to work long hours in activities such as harvesting and processing of kelp an activity that reached its peak in the West Highlands between 1750 and 1815. Repression of Jacobitism, the Jacobite Risings brought repeated government efforts to curb those clans who supported James VII of Scotland and II of England and James Francis Edward Stuart and Charles Edward Stuart. The government of the day responded with repression after the 1746 Battle of Culloden, the last major attempt by the Stuarts to reclaim the throne. The 1746 Act of Prescription, incorporating the Dress Act, required all swords to be surrendered to the government. It prohibited the traditional wearing of clan tartans and kilts. The Ten Years' Abolition Act 1660 ended the feudal bond of military service by crofters to their chiefs, and the Heritable Jurisdictions Act removed the virtually sovereign power which the chiefs held over their clans. The government's enforcement of the prohibitions varied and often related to the degree of a clan's support during the rebellion. But, overall these actions led to the destruction of the traditional clan system and of the supportive social structures of small agricultural townships. From about 1725, in the aftermath of the first Jacobite Rising, Highlanders had begun emigrating to the Americas in increasing numbers. Under the Disarming Act of 1746 and the Clan Act, the Crown made ineffectual attempts to subdue the Scottish Highlands, and eventually sent in troops. Government garrisons were built or extended in the Great Glen at Fort William, Cully Women and Fort George, Inverness, as well as barracks at Ruthven, Bernera and Inversned, linked to the south by the Wade Roads. These had the effect of limiting organizational travel and choking off news. And further isolated the clans. But, social conditions remained unsettled for the whole decade. Economic improvements What became known as the clearances were regarded by the landlords as necessary improvements to make agriculture viable. They are thought to have been begun by Admiral John Ross of Bailnagar and Castle in 1762. MacLeod of MacLeod began experimental work on Skye in 1732. 
chiefs hired lowland, or sometimes English, factors with expertise in more profitable sheep farming. They encouraged, sometimes forcibly, the population to move off land judged suitable for raising sheep. To landlords, improvement and clearance did not necessarily mean depopulation. At least until the 1820s, when there were steep falls in the price of kelp, landlords wanted to create pools of cheap or virtually free labor, supplied by families subsisting in new crofting townships. Having the crofters collect and process kelp yielded profits to the landlords, and they petitioned successfully for legislation designed to stop emigration, leading to the Passenger Vessels Act 1803. Attitudes changed during the 1820s and, for many landlords, the Great Potato Famine, which began in 1846, became another reason to encourage or force emigration and depopulation. Before the beginning of the clearances, there were examples of clan chiefs responding to these emerging problems before Culloden. Michael Lynch notes that, if there was a clash within the, the Jacobites and Hanoverians who fought at Culloden between a supposedly backward-looking Highland society and a progressive, capitalist lowland economy, it was not a clear-cut one. Cameron of Lochiel, who fought for Charles, was as much a representative of a new capitalist attitude to Highland estate management as was the House of Argyll, ever the mainstay of support for the Hanoverian regime. Clan land had become the private property of individual landlords. Nevertheless, many of those landlords also struggled against harsh economic realities. Much of the drama and tragedy of the Highlands is told in the negotiations between financially wrecked landlords and their creditors, agents and trustees. The best of intentions were never enough amid the more populous and improvement-driven world of the mid-century Highlands. The government gave financial aid for roads and bridges to assist the new sheep-based agriculture and trade. Year of the Sheep Another wave of mass emigration came in 1792, known to Gaelic-speaking Highlanders as the Bladnanan Korach. Landlords had been clearing land to establish sheep farming. In 1792 tenant farmers from Strathridsdale led a protest by driving more than 6,000 sheep off the land surrounding Ardros. This action, commonly referred to as the Rosshire Sheep Riot, was dealt with at the highest levels in the government. The Home Secretary Henry Dundas became involved. He had the Black Watch mobilized. It halted the drive and brought the ringleaders to trial. They were found guilty, but later escaped custody and disappeared. The people were relocated to poor crofts. Others were sent to small farms in coastal areas, where farming could not sustain the population, and they were expected to take up fishing as a new trade. In the village of Bad Beer in Kethness, the weather conditions were so harsh that, while the women worked, they had to tether their livestock and their children to rocks or posts to prevent them being blown over the cliffs. Other crofters were transported directly to emigration ships, bound for North America or Australia. Religion From the Reformation, practicing Roman Catholicism was illegal as was the ownership of any property by a Roman Catholic, which was identified with Jacobitism, and unacceptable in higher society. The number of adherents of Catholicism is difficult to estimate but it was a definite minority of the Scottish population, though a majority in some parts of the Western Highlands. In 1755 it was estimated that there were some 16,500 communicants, mainly in the north and west. In 1764, the total Catholic population in Scotland would have been about 33,000 or 2.6% of the total population. Of these 23,000 were in the Highlands. Another estimate for 1764 is of 13,166 Catholics in the Highlands, perhaps a quarter of whom had emigrated by 1790. Dawson and Farber note that although the landlords did not target people for ethnic or religious reasons, the effect of the clearances was to destroy much of the Gaelic culture, which was dispersed along with the people that fled and Protestants were the majority both of the Highland population generally and of those cleared. Nevertheless, anti-Catholic sentiment was a contributory factor in some clearances. Second phase of the clearances It was only in the early 19th century that the second, more brutal phase of the clearances began. This was well before the visit by George IV in 1822, 
when lowlanders set aside their previous distrust and hatred of the highlanders and identified with them as national symbols. Most notorious are the examples of landlords trying to exploit changing economic circumstances to their financial advantage by clearing uneconomical tenants from their land, making room for more profitable uses such as sheep, deer forests or tourism. Two of the best documented such clearances are those from the land of the Duchess of Sutherland carried out by her factor Patrick Seller, and the Glencarvey clearances which were witnessed and documented by a London Times reporter. In 1807 Elizabeth Gordon, 19th Countess of Sutherland, touring her inheritance with her husband Lord Stafford, wrote that he is seized as much as I am with the rage of improvements, and we both turn our attention with the greatest of energy to turnips. As well as turning land over to sheep farming, Stafford planned to invest in creating a coal pit, salt pans, brick and tile works and herring fisheries. That year his agents began the evictions, and ninety families were forced to leave their crops in the ground and move their cattle, furniture and timbers to the land they were offered twenty miles away on the coast, living in the open until they had built themselves new houses. This plan has been described as a typical example of social engineering which met neither the hopes of the benefactors nor the needs of the beneficiaries, but produced social disaster. The Sutherland's first commissioner, William Young, arrived in 1809, and soon engaged Patrick Seller as his factor, who pressed ahead with the process while acquiring sheep farming estates for himself. The Sutherlands were responsible for brutal clearances between 1811 and 1820. Seller threw people out in person if they showed any reluctance to go, and burned down their crofts to make sure they never came back. Evictions of 2,000 families in one day were not uncommon. Many starved and froze to death where their homes had once been. The Duchess of Sutherland, on seeing the starving tenants on her husband's estate, remarked in a letter to a friend in England, Scotch people are of happier constitution and do not fatten like the larger breed of animals. Donald MacLeod, a Sutherland crofter, wrote about the events he witnessed, the consternation and confusion were extreme. Little or no time was given for the removal of persons or property. The people striving to remove the sick and the helpless before the fire should reach them. Next, struggling to save the most valuable of their effects. The cries of the women and children, the roaring of the affrighted cattle hunted at the same time by the yelling dogs of the shepherds amid the smoke and fire, altogether presented a scene that completely baffles description a euro it required to be seen to be believed. A dense cloud of smoke enveloped the whole country by day, and even extended far out to sea. At night an awfully grand but terrific scene presented itself a euro all the houses in an extensive district in flames at once. I myself ascended a height about eleven o'clock in the evening, and counted 250 blazing houses, many of the owners of which I personally knew, but whose present condition a euro whether in or out of the flames a euro I could not tell. The conflagration lasted six days, till the whole of the dwellings were reduced to ashes or smoking ruins. During one of these days a boat actually lost her way in the dense smoke as she approached the shore, but at night was enabled to reach a landing place by the lurid light of the flames. Accounts like those of MacLeod and General David Stewart of Garth brought widespread condemnation. Two old people evicted at Seller's orders were too ill to go far. He left them exposed to the chill northern air and they died. He was acquitted on a charge of manslaughter, but the Duchess wrote, The more I hear and see of Seller the more I am convinced that he is not to be trusted more than he is at present. He is so exceedingly greedy and harsh with the people. There are very heavy complaints against him from Strathnava. In due course Seller was dismissed from his post. Elsewhere, the flamboyant Alexander Renaldson MacDonnell of Glengarry portrayed himself as the last genuine specimen of the true Highland chief while his tenants were subjected to a relentless process of eviction. He abandoned his disbanded regiment. Its Catholic chaplain, Alexander MacDonnell led the men and their families to settle in Glengarry County. Eastern Ontario, Canada. The area was a major destination for Highland emigrants in the 18th century and early 19th century, and Gaelic was the native tongue of the settlement. In respect for their ancestors' Scottish culture, the county hosts the annual Glengarry Highland Games, one of the biggest Highland Games gatherings of its kind outside Scotland. Potato Famine 
as in Ireland, the potato crop failed in the mid-19th century, and a widespread outbreak of cholera further weakened the highland population. The ongoing clearance policy resulted in starvation, deaths, and a secondary clearance, when families either migrated voluntarily or were forcibly evicted. There were many deaths of children and old people. As there were few alternatives, people emigrated, joined the army, or moved to growing urban centres such as Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Dundee in Lowland Scotland and Newcastle upon Tyne and Liverpool in the north of England. In places some people were given economic incentives to move, but in many instances landlords used violent methods. In 1851, following his tour of the Western Highlands and Isles, Sir John McNeill wrote, The inhabitants of these distressed districts have neither capital enough to cultivate the extent of the land necessary to maintain them if it could be provided, nor have they land enough where the capital supplied to them. Richards considers this observation to be the central dilemma of the crofter economy. After the potato blight, there were more people than the land could support. Pseudoscientific Racism With the development of pseudoscientific racist ideas from about 1850, the clearances were at times supported by belief that the Celtic race was inferior to the Anglo-Saxon race. George Coombe's popular and influential The Constitution of Man, published in 1828, provided a framework which would be used by some to support theories of racial superiority. In 1850 Robert Knox published The Races of Men, which asserted the inferiority of the Celt compared to the Anglo-Saxon and Nordic races. The view that the economic failures of the Highlands were due to the shortcomings of the Celtic race was shared and expressed by the two most important Scottish newspapers, The Scotsman and the Glasgow Herald Euro, and even the more northerly Inverness Courier. In 1851 the Scotsman wrote that a Euroe collective emigration is, therefore, the removal of a diseased and damaged part of our population. It is a relief to the rest of the population to be rid of this part of Euro. Similar views were held by senior public officials. Sir Charles Trevelyan was co-founder with Sir John McNeill of the Highland and Island Immigration Society. In a letter to McNeill in 1852 he wrote that a Euro OEA national a 40 euro would now be necessary in order to rid the land of a Euro OAD surviving Irish and Scotch Celts a Euro. The exodus would then allow for the settlement of a racially superior people of Teutonic stock. He welcomed a Euro OAD prospects of flights of Germans settling here in increasing numbers a Euro an orderly, moral, industrious and frugal people, less foreign to us than the Irish or Scotch Celt a congenial element which will readily assimilate with our body politic a euro. The flights of Germans in the above quotation may relate to significant emigration from Germany in the years that followed the failure of the German March Revolution of 1848, political responses, Karl Marx was living in London during the peak of the national controversy over the Highland clearances. In Das Kapital he described them as the spoliation of the church's property, the fraudulent alienation of the state domains, the robbery of the common lands, the usurpation of feudal and clan property, and its transformation into modern private property under circumstances of reckless terrorism. The Highland Land League eventually achieved land reform in the enactment of crofting acts, but these could not bring economic viability and came too late, at a time when the land was already suffering from depopulation. Legacy of the Clearances the Canadian Boat Song expresses the desolation felt by those exiled from poor, but tight-knit communities with a long-standing, distinctive, and rich culture, yet still the blood is strong, the heart is highland, and we in dreams behold the Hebrides. The diaspora was worldwide, but emigrants settled in close communities in Nova Scotia, the Glengarry and Kingston areas of Ontario and the Carolinas of the American colonies. Canadian Gaelic was widely spoken for some two centuries. One estimate for Cape Breton, Nova Scotia has 25,000 Gaelic-speaking Scots arriving as immigrants between 1775 and 1850. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were an estimated 100,000 Gaelic speakers in Cape Breton, but because of economic migration to English-speaking areas and the lack of Gaelic education in the Nova Scotian school system, the numbers of Gaelic speakers fell dramatically. By the beginning of the 21st century, 
the number of native Gaelic speakers had fallen to well below 1,000 though Highland surnames are still common in areas of Nova Scotia, such as in the town of Antigonish and the island of Cape Breton. Highland surnames are also widespread in Canada, the USA, Australia, and New Zealand. Memorials to the Clearances, Scotland On July 23, 2007, the Scottish First Minister Alex Salmond unveiled a three-metre-high bronze exile statue in Helmsdale, Sutherland, which commemorates the people who were cleared from the area by landowners and left their homeland to begin new lives overseas. The statue, which depicts a family leaving their home, stands at the mouth of the Strath of Kildon and was funded by Dennis MacLeod, a Scottish-Canadian mining millionaire who also attended the ceremony. Canada an identical three-metre-high bronze exile statue has also been set up on the banks of the Red River in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. See also, Lowland Clearances, Ethnic Cleansing, Clan Macdonnell of Glengarry, Highland Land League, Crofting, Rural Flight, Scottish-Canadian, References. External links, Narratives in a Landscape. Monuments and Memories of the Sutherland Clearances Dissertation on the Landscape of the Clearances, Abandoned Communities, The Clearance of Strathnava 1814-1819, The Cultural Impact of the Highland Clearances, a BBC History article by Ross Noble, The Highland Clearances. Article by Thomas Devine, published in Refresh 4, Spring 1987. The Impact of the Highland Clearances on One Mile Family and Their Aftermath a linear case study. HTTP, www.blackshousedemon.co.uk slash knockin.htm, Bad Beer Descendants website, Clanship, Doothchis and Culloden, The Prelude to Clearance, Further Reading, An Overview of the Clearances, Alexander Mackenzie, 1881. Gloomy Memories, Donald MacLeod, 1857. Soil and Soul. People vs. Corporate Power, Alistair McIntosh, Oran Press Limited, 2004, ISBN 1-85410-802-6, The Highland Clearances, John Preble, Secker and Wahlberg, 1963, The Highland Clearances, Eric Richards, Glean Books, 2000. A History of the Highland Clearances. Volume 1, Agrarian Transformation and the Evictions 1746 1886, Eric Richards, Krum Helm, C. 1982, 0856644966, x The Strathnava Trilogy, Ian Grimble 3 Vols, Chief of Mackay, The Trial of Patrick Seller, and The World of Robdon. The People of Glengarry. Highlanders in Transition, 1745 1820, Marianne McLean. McGill Queen's University Press. 1993. Die Scottischen Clans im 18. Giant von Wandel und den Dine Hochland Selschaft im Rand Europas, A Personal Passion Play in Scottish History and Bibliography, Hubert Bell, Regensburg 2003. The Making of the Crofting Community, James Hunter, John Donald Publishers Limited. Second Revised Edition. Das Kapital. Karl Marx, Charles H. Kerr and Company. 1906, Volume I, Part 8, Chapter XXVII, Statistical Accounts of Scotland, Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, The Modern Library Classics, Complete and Unabridged, 2000, Book 3, Chapter 4.